spring mm -hmm. of every year, women, young and old, flock to bridal shows and wedding fairs as they plan for the perfect wedding ceremony as the fulfillment of their childhood dreams. Bridal shows have been a, a rite of passage for as long as I can remember, but now there's a new trend that's emerging across the globe. It's called the divorce fair. The divorce fair. Vendors of all sorts purchase booth space and they essentially offer their wares to those who are in need. Those who are newly singled can choose from a host of services such as life coaches, uh, lawyers, financial advisors, even private investigators uh, are available. And the opportunities don't just end there. You can find counselors, astrologers, psychics, hypnotists, and of course plastic surgeons, otherwise known as wellness surgeons uh, in our day. Uh, they're all there to help work out those nasty self-image issues that are come as a result of the pain of a divorce. And, and they do. D divorce is an ugly thing, and it's a very painful thing for many people. But the point I want to make here is that the emergence of the divorce fair is just another sign of our broken times. How did we get to such a place of dysfunction? When you stop and you think about it, you know, how do we get to a place where we have divorce fairs? You know, this just isn't the way that it was meant to be. Well, I believe it's because our relativistic culture has lost what we might call a covenant worldview, a covenant worldview. And because I believe this concept of covenant is so absolutely critical to us knowing God, walking with God, finding who we are in life, uh, we're going to spend the next three sessions really talking about the concept of covenant in one way or another. We can see remnants of covenant thinking in almost every culture across the face of the globe. And, and it's not something that's readily visible in our culture, but we're all aware of it to some degree. It shows up in movies. You know, we, we've all seen movies, uh, maybe like the Pirates of the Caribbean, where there was a, a covenant and a curse that went with it. Uh, I remember Robin Hood, where, where Robin was standing over his father's grave, and he cut himself with a dagger, and, and by the, the blood from his hand, he swore that he would avenge his father's death. That, that was a covenant that he made with himself. It was a covenant oath. Uh, we see it in weddings, when we have the you know, exchange of vows in a wedding, the exchange of rings, you know, the, the sharing of, of uh, a communion meal or, or uh, celebrating with the meal afterwards, having a toast. Those are all remnants of covenant thinking that we see in, in our wedding ceremonies. The concept of covenant is as old at least as the human race. It goes back to the beginning of time. And so it's important for us to discuss this. Well, a good place to start is what does a covenant mean? What, what is a covenant? Webster defines covenant as a usually formal, solemn, and binding agreement. A usually formal, solemn, and binding agreement. If we want to look at it from a biblical perspective, you really need to add to the mix the idea that it's sacred. That, that a covenant is formal, it's solemn, it's binding, but it's also sacred in the eyes of God. Historically, covenant is a legal concept that essentially means uh, relational oneness, relational oneness. When two individuals enter into a covenant, their possessions, their friendships, their enemies become shared. That if, if we enter into a covenant and you have an enemy, your enemy immediately becomes my, my enemy. Even identities become shared. If you, if you look back historically to some of the ancient covenants, it was not uncommon for two individuals to exchange robes. And so when there was the exchange of robes, there was in a sense the exchange of identity. And we get a little bit of taste of this, you know, in, in high school where you have a guy and girl start going together and he gives her what? His class jacket and she begins to wear the class jacket. You know, it, it's, it's not in the same depth of uh, a binding nature that a covenant is, but it's kind of the taste of the shared identities that we're talking about. A covenant in ancient times was very different than a contract today. Today, contracts in many cases are made to be broken. Uh, with a covenant, there was no talk of what's best for me. You know, if, if you think about our, our professional sports world, it's not uncommon for an athlete to hold out in the final year of his contract in order to negotiate a better contract. And, and that's just understandable. Everybody kind of expects that to happen in our society. But if it were a covenant relationship, that athlete would probably be killed <laughs> and bring horrible curses upon himself because he broke something that was of a sacred and binding nature. In some cultures, a man couldn't marry the sister of a covenant brother because she became his sister. So a covenant is, is that strong and that binding. And again, it, it's a concept that was very common to cultures all across the globe for the most part. To some peoples, the thought of breaking a covenant was totally foreign. It was just like a, a concept that you would, what do you mean break a covenant? You just wouldn't do that. In 2009, summer of 2009, Texas financier Alan Stanford was indicted uh, for a $7 billion investment fraud. 
One of the reasons that he was able to perpetuate this fraud for so long was that he had cut a covenant, a blight covenant, with the CEO of the Financial Services Regulatory Commission of Antigua. And so he was sworn to secrecy that nobody could talk about it or tell about it. Now, $7 billion is an awful lot of money. It's an absurd amount of money. But what really struck me about this situation was not the money involved. It was the fact that the media thought it was all very strange. When the media repeated or reported the fact that there was this blood covenant or this blood oath taken, they reported it as though it was like this bizarre thing. And so what this tells us is that the concept of covenant is something that has really been lost to Western culture. That, that as a culture, we don't get it. We don't understand the significance uh, of this issue. Marriage once provided a pretty good example for us, but that was a long time ago and in another era. Our church covenants, what we call church covenants, really are agreements. They're not covenants. Uh, you know, they, don't, they don't have the binding nature and, and power of a covenant. And, and actually what happens is that when we do these things called church covenants, uh, what we're doing is we're watering down the concept because we're using it in a way that it was never intended to be used. Our contemporary U.S. culture really doesn't have anything like a covenant. When you think about it, when you think about the way we function as a society, we just don't have it. We don't have anything that, that resembles a covenant that we would find in ancient times or in, in biblical times. In fact, much of the progress of our civilization was built upon broken covenants, which we call treaties with the Native Americans. You know, to the Native Americans, when they entered into a treaty, it was a covenant. It was, it was to be a lifelong thing that you were totally honest. Whereas to the U.S. Uh, government or to, to those that represented the, you know, the white people coming in, I think there was maybe only one covenant that was never broken, and that was William Penn what, that he established with the, the Native Americans in Pennsylvania. But as a whole, we broke them all. And it's because we either didn't care or we didn't understand. A true covenant is intended to be indissoluble and absolute. Indissoluble and absolute, often extending beyond a lifetime. A covenant breaker was considered the lowest of all scoundrels and worthy of horrible curses. A covenant breaker was considered the lowest of all scoundrels and worthy of horrible curses. The loss of a covenant worldview means a loss of trust, and it's a primary reason that our culture is unraveling the way that it is. Spouses are disloyal to spouses. Government leaders in many cases serve their own interests. I mean, an oath of office has its roots in covenant. It was meant to, to be a commitment, a devotion to, to the good of the people. And, and if you don't have a covenant worldview, what happens is that truth becomes subservient to personal agendas. And so it becomes about me. It comes about my desire. It comes about my dreams and my visions and not so much about the, the commitment that I'm making when I'm entering into this covenant relationship. Now, there are two primary types of covenants that we can talk about, and those are human and divine. There are human covenants and divine covenants. In a human covenant, two human parties agree to certain terms. And, you know, they, they can be different terms, but for some individuals, if you would enter into the right covenant with the right person, it could be hugely beneficial. There can be some, some really good things that would come out of it. Blood covenants were once very, very common and uh, just a way of life in many cultures. H. Clay Trumbull, who was a Christian scholar many years ago, who kind of rediscovered the concept of covenant as it had been lost, wrote this about blood covenanting. He called it a form of mutual covenanting by which two persons enter into the closest, most enduring, and the most sacred of compacts as friends and brothers or as more than brothers through the inner commingling of blood. Now that kind of might uh, repel some of us today, but again, there was a day when this was a way of life. This is how you entered into a, to a relationship, a covenant relationship. A covenant representative would sometimes participate in a ceremony establishing a covenant for an entire clan. One would initiate, all were joined. And this concept of covenant representative is one that you want to remember because we're going to come to it later. But, but you could have a clan, two clans, or two tribes, and rather than everyone go through the whole blood covenant ceremony, you just have two representatives, one from each group. And the terms of the covenant apply to everybody, but it's the covenant representative who actually cuts the covenant with the other individual. Ancient covenant ceremonies often included animal sacrifices. And uh, it involved the cutting of animals that signified the curses that would come upon individuals if they broke the covenant. 
And, and this was typical of all covenants. And so I, I've used the term cutting a covenant, and, and some scholars believe that it refers to the fact that they cut animals as a sacrifices. And essentially what they were saying is that if, if I or we break this covenant, then horrible curses are going to come onto our heads as a result of us breaking this sacred compact that we have with one another. Henry Stanley traveled extensively across Africa in, in search of the famed Dr. Livingstone, if you're familiar with that, and his adventures. And he claimed to have cut covenant with up to 50 African chiefs at, at different times. And, and listen to what was spoken during one particular covenant ceremony with the great chief, African chief Marambo. If either of you break this brotherhood now established between you, may the lion devour him, the serpent poison him, bitterness be in his food, his friends desert him, his gun burst in his hands and wound him, and everything that is bad do wrong to him until death. That was, the, the, that was how absolute, how sacred and devoted a covenant was to be, that anybody who would break such a covenant would suffer horrible curses upon their heads. And everybody understood this. You went into this relationship knowing that this was the consequence of breaking it. So we have human covenants, but we also have divine covenants. And divine covenants are those which God initiates, and he sets the terms, essentially. He's God, so he gets to do that. And with divine covenants, there are two types of those. One is unconditional. That uh, when God makes an unconditional covenant with humanity, it doesn't matter what we do. He's going to uphold the terms of that covenant. And the best example we see in Scripture of this, I think, is Noah. That, that after the flood, uh, God put what in the sky? A rainbow. And the rainbow is a reminder of his covenant with the human race that he would never flood the earth again. And it doesn't matter what we do as a human race, this will never happen. God will never flood the earth again because of this, this covenant. There are also conditional covenants. When God would say to the Israelites, obey my commands and it will go well with you, uh, it was a type of covenant that depended upon a human response, that if we were to experience the benefits, or they were to experience the benefits of that covenant, there was a certain degree of obedience that they had to exercise in order to receive those benefits. Without an understanding of covenant, we cannot understand God or the Bible. This concept is totally foundational to the scriptures, to knowing God, to the Christian faith, to our ability to relate to God. And if we don't have a foundation of covenant in our lives, we can look at things and, and God just doesn't make sense in many situations. His actions appear to be unfair. Uh, doubts begin to fill our minds and faith really becomes something that's elusive because we can, you know, you look at something like, well, how could a loving God send people to hell? If we don't understand that, we begin to have doubts about God and his goodness. And these are all covenant issues, and so it's important that we understand this concept and recognize how it relates to our ability to walk with God. So we're going to take a look back, and we're going to go back to the garden at the very beginning once again, and we're going to see how this concept of covenant plays out from the very beginning. In the garden, God established a covenant known as the Edenic Covenant with the human race through Adam. The word covenant is not found in early Genesis, but covenant language is used. And elsewhere, uh, in particular in uh, Hosea 6-7, God talks about our broken covenant, the covenant that Adam broke with him. God's covenant with Adam was undoubtedly to our advantage. The, the God promised to do abundantly good things in our lives. He promised to bless. He promised to give us a place of dominion. So God establishing this covenant with the human race was really to our benefit in a significant way. Our very doable part was simply to obey God and to submit to his protective boundaries. And actually, there was only one. And so we find this in, in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. It says, Then the Lord God commanded the man, You may eat freely from the fruit of every tree of the orchard, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. And so they had an unlimited menu of choices with all the other trees of the garden. And there was just this one tree, one boundary that they had to submit to in order to keep the covenant. And, and obviously they failed. But when you understand this, it helps us to further grasp the seriousness of Adam and Eve's disobedience. See, we don't understand the penalty of the curse over humanity because we don't understand the absolute nature of a covenant. When you realize the, the, the penalty, the curse that comes with breaking a covenant, you begin to realize how horrible it was for us to, to do what we did to God. It was more than a treasonous coup. It was definitely a treasonous coup, but it was more. Mankind is worthy of curses in hell because we broke a sacred and binding covenant 
with the creator of the universe. We were covenant breakers as a human race. For God to seek our welfare is simply amazing. How many times have we wanted to squish people for doing something that was far less serious to us? And God continued to establish covenants with humanity, covenants which we always seem to make every effort to break. God's plan culminated with the new covenant, which is entirely different than all others. On the cross, Jesus suffered the curses of a covenant breaker. The penalty that Christ paid on that cross was the curse of a covenant breaker. It was our curse. Fulfilling all the requirements of the law, he initiated an entirely new type of covenant relationship in which God would dwell in us and give us a new heart or a new operating system, if you want to talk about that like we did last time. God established a totally new covenant. Not just new as in uh, time-wise new, but new as in different. Totally different, totally unique than anything that there was before. That, that not only does God call us to a lifestyle, but he puts his very presence within us, giving us the ability to do whatever he calls us to do. If we're to fully understand this amazing new covenant, we really need to go back in time again. And, and this time we want to take a look at the life of Abram. Abraham was the father of the Christian faith. If we want to understand law, we go back to Moses and, and we look at the, the initiation of law uh, through the Mosaic law. If we want to understand the new covenant, we really need to go back to the life of Abraham and, and see his root, the roots of, of what took place with him. Abram, as he originally know, was known, lived for 99 years with a but in his life. What do I mean? I mean, no matter how much he owned, or no matter how well he excelled, there was always the shame of having no son to carry on his family lineage. Now, no matter how much he prospered, no matter how much it looked like God's favor was on his life, he always had that shame that he didn't have a son. And it's kind of like a coach who has an incredible team every year, but never makes it beyond the first round of the playoffs. And, and after, you know, at first everybody is like wild by his abilities, but after a while they begin to say, but, yeah, he's a good coach, but. He's never made it to the big dance. He's never won the big game. And, and so this was really the shame that Abraham lived under, the stigma that uh, he didn't have what was considered to be the most important thing of the day, and that was a son to be the heir of his, of his uh, fortune of, of all that he had. And so Abram could have become a really bitter person. When you look at his life circumstances, he could have become extremely bitter because of what he went through. God spoke to Abram when he was 75 years old and childless, shadowed by shame because he had no heir. And we're going to take a look here in the, in the book of Genesis and just read a little bit about Abram's life because there's so much that we can draw from his circumstances. Let, let's look at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. I want to make just four very brief observations from this passage in Genesis chapter 12. Number one, it was God who initiated the relationship. God was the one who initiated. Number two, Abram was challenged to walk away from everything that was predictable and familiar in his life. Number three, the terms were really, really good. I will bless you. I will, I will make you an exceedingly great nation. And then number four, Abram responded by obeying God. He did what God called him to do. Let's fast forward and we want to look at Genesis chapter 15 where Abram has another encounter with the God of the universe. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? Abram continued, Look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars. If you're able to count them, then he said to him, Your offspring will be that numerous. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abram believed 
the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6 is one of the key verses in all of scripture because it sets the stage in defining man's relationship with our creator. The Hebrew word for believe, which is amon, can be translated as faith or faithful. Faith or faithful. And implicit here is the idea that Abram gave himself fully to God, both in trust and in trustworthiness. Abram gave himself fully to God, both in trust and in trustworthiness. And what was God's response? Oh yeah, that is what I'm looking for. That's what I want, is that type of trust that you have. Remember Harry Colcord, London's manager? Harry Colcord knew Blondin so well that he was willing to stake his life on his ability. When we talk about the situation with Abraham, Abraham knew God. He knew who God was. He knew that God was faithful to his promises. And so he pretty much staked the entire future uh, of him, his destiny, his, his family, all upon the shoulders of God, knowing that he was going to answer his promises. He was going to fulfill those promises. Essentially, Abram put the full weight of his future on God's back. Remember the unknown is that territory where the internal states of our hearts rise to the surface. When we get into the unknown, it's where everything that is in here comes up. You know, when we have situations where we become fearful or angry or, or whatever it might be, those are just indicators of what's already inside of us. These are things that are in us. The circumstances just bring these things out. And so the unknown is intended to be that place where, where God perfects our faith, where we come to experientially know him and that our hearts are purified and, and we're transformed as we come to know him and to know his ways. It's where our faith makes that ever so long migration from our heads to our hearts. The unknown is the place where our faith makes that ever so long migration from our heads to our hearts. It's the longest foot in the world, really. Abram was a pioneer whose journey provides a life pattern for every Christian. His journey provides a life pattern for every one of us. Let's continue with Genesis chapter 15. And we want to look now at verses 7 through 9. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. How will I know? How will I know? That was Abram's question. Now, this wasn't a question of unbelief. We look at the context. What does verse 6 say? Abram believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And, and so he wasn't doubting God. What he was looking to do, I think, in a sense, was get God to show his hand. He was getting, uh, trying to get him to show him something more uh, of what he had planned or how he wanted to do it. And, and so at this point in time, God commands Abram to, to prepare these sacrifices. And Abram realizes immediately that God is initiating a covenant ceremony. He realizes right off the bat that he is initiating a covenant ceremony. And at this point, Abram realizes that he is in with God that he is in with God. For the creator of the universe to cut covenant with a human, the, the thought was, it's just absolutely crazy to stop and think about that. For, for the perfect, powerful, incredibly infinite God of the universe to enter into a covenant with a sinful, imperfect, finite human, it's just a crazy thought. And, and so there's this intense emotion that comes with the idea of being in. You know, and we experience it on a small scale. You know, you make the team, you land the job, you get the ring, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, being in is, is what we're looking for. But to be in with the creator of the universe, there's nothing that can compare with this. And so Abram realized that this was what was going on in this situation. We're going to fast forward one more time in Abram's life. And at this point... It's been 24 years since his encounter with God. And Abram is 99 years old, and he still doesn't have the promised son. His wife, Sarah, is 90, and, and the promises are just, they, they seem far away. At, at one point, they tried to take things into their own hands, and that left to the, led to the birth of Ishmael. And, and when you stop and you think about it, I mean, all of the conflict that we have taking place today in the Middle East, all, all the lives lost, all the, just the, horrible stuff that, that this continues to take place is the result of Abram's failure in this situation. But what's really interesting with this is that God never defines Abram by his failure. 
you never see this emphasized in the scripture, even mentioned beyond when it actually happened. And, and it, it's almost as though God is unaware of the fact that it happened. And this gives us a really an awesome taste of the new covenant. When, when we look at how God related to Abram, we get that taste of the new covenant. Hebrews uh, 8.12 tells us, For I will be merciful to their wrongdoing, and I will never again remember their sins. And, and so even though Abram's failure has led to so much death and destruction and damage, God never defines Abram by that failure, which is really, again, it's a message for all of us. Looking back over time, we can see things pretty clearly. But from Abram's perspective, at that lonely time and that lonely place, things really must have looked pretty bleak, or they could have looked impossibly bleak for him. The mountaintop promises of God appear to fade very quickly when we return to the trenches of life. I think we can all relate to that. Probably most of us, if not all of us, have had experiences where it just seemed like God was so near. Uh, maybe it was a retreat or a conference or just some situation where God touched your life and, and it just seemed like everything is awesome, like you were just standing in heaven. And, and you go from the conference or from whatever situation and you go back down into the trenches of life and very quickly all of the garbage of life returns and it seems like the promises of God are so distant and, and so far away. And, and this is probably what happened in Abram's situation. And, and now we're looking at 24 years from the initial promise till this point in time, and still we don't see the answer. Let, let's read again at, at Genesis 17, and, and let's see how God interacts with him here. Genesis 17, verses 1 through 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the sovereign God. Walk before me and be blameless. Then I will confirm my covenant between me and you, and I will give you a multitude of descendants. Abram bowed down with his face to the ground, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer will your name be Abram. Instead, your name will be Abraham, because I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will descend from you. I will confirm my covenant as a perpetual covenant between me and you. And you. It will extend to your descendants after you throughout their generations. I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. I will give you the whole land of Canaan, the land where you are now residing, to you and your descendants after you as a permanent possession. I will be their God. I want to make four more observations from this passage, and then we'll bring this session to a close. Genesis 17, 1 through 8. First observation is that Abram and Sarai received new names redefining their identities to reflect their covenant relationship with God. And scholars really aren't sure about the new names uh, and exactly what Abraham means. Uh, the idea, though, is that it's unique. It's different than what it once was. And so it becomes Abraham, Sarah. And so God enters into this relationship with them, and their identities are redefined in a totally new way. And, and really, this is, this is true for every one of us. Anyone who encounters the God of the universe, who comes into a relationship, a covenant relationship with him, receives a new identity that is of a higher order than anything that this earth has to offer. Second, as seen later in Scripture, the God of the universe, in a sense, takes on a new identity and begins to define himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this is the one that blows my mind. I mean, for Abram and Sarah to receive new identities, well, yeah, of, of course, that would make sense. But God begins to call himself the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, meaning that the creator of the universe defines himself by his relationship with humans. That, that's just mind-boggling to me. Number three, God's covenant was with Abraham and his descendants and his descendants. And what we see from the scriptures from the New Testament is that Gentiles or non-Jews become Abraham's descendants through the new covenant with Christ. So that, so that whenever we enter into a covenant relationship with God, we become descendants of Abraham and the promises that were given to him apply to us as well. We need to understand with this too, that when we talk about Jews and Gentiles, when we discuss Gentiles, we're talking about the descendants of Ishmael as well. And so the descendants of Ishmael, those who are considered to be Arabs or uh, whatever it might be, many you know, uh, peoples that are actually at war with Israel right now, when they come to faith in Christ, they become 
the spiritual descendants of Abraham. Even though they are physically now, they become spiritually the sons of Abraham uh, whenever they come into that covenant relationship. And then number four, God was faithful to fulfill his promise in due season. God was faithful to fulfill his promise in due season. Time doesn't do to God what it does to us. Time doesn't do to God what it does to us. Somehow we, we have this thing that when time passes and we don't see a promise right away, we begin to freak out. We begin to think that, that he forgot about us. And, and what this is telling us, you know, Abraham's situation took place over the course of 25 years, practically, from the time he was given the promise till we saw it fulfilled. And so what we see is that if we stay connected to God, he will not only fulfill his promises, but he will transform our lives and he will perfect his faith in us. How will I know? That was Abram's question. How will I know? And, and what we need to understand here is that God absolutely loves every person on the face of this earth, but not everybody benefits from God's love. See, as Abram's descendants, it's our covenant with the God of the universe that makes us to be different. Does God love everybody? Yeah, God absolutely loves everybody. But not everybody can experience the blessings that come from a covenant relationship if they don't enter into that covenant relationship. It's when we enter that covenant through, through Christ that we experience the blessings that come with this relationship with God. And, and like Abraham, every one of us has what I call a high embitterment potential. A high embitterment potential. What am I saying? We all have circumstances in life that don't go the way that we want them to go. Some of us maybe have, have been dealt a bad hand, or at least we see it as a bad hand, where, where life has been very unfair, circumstances very unfair, life very difficult, or whatever it might be. And, and we can allow those circumstances to make us bitter. Or, like Abraham, we can lay hold of the promises of God, and we can see God perfect his faith in our lives and, and, and do an awesome work. Adversity and time either yield hardness and bitterness or they bring hope and love. And it really comes down to our response as to whether or not we lay hold of God's promises, whether we trust him, whether we persevere in faith, or whether we allow ourselves to become hardened and cynical. You see, what happens as we hold on to the promises of God, as we believe in him during difficult times, the presence of the Holy Spirit permeates every area of our lives and we become transformed into the nature of God. I, I like to think of us as spiritual crock pots. You know, I, I like crock. I like to eat, <laughs> you know, you put all that stuff in a crock pot and, you know, it may not be that great when you put it in, but you let that thing simmer over the course of a day. And, and when you go and you lift that lid, oh, boy, is it good. That aroma is delicious. And, and this really is a picture of life and the way life works for us. That, that God allows circumstances in our lives where the heat gets turned up. Where, where things are difficult, where maybe they're frustrating, maybe they're really challenging. And if we allow that seal of faith to be placed over our lives, the very presence and nature of God begins to permeate everything. And, and we look at the situation and, and we kind of scream and say, God, it's too hot. It's too hot. Let me out of here. And, and God's going, oh, smell the aroma. It's just getting good. It's just getting good. My presence and my character are now being integrated with you in such a way that they can never be separated. And, and so God did such a work in the life of Abraham, and it's a work that he wants to repeat in every one of our lives. No matter how flawed we are, no matter how much we're tempted to give up, God's devotion to his covenant children is absolute. God's devotion to his covenant children is absolute. He will never abandon us. The question is, what we believe. Let me pray. Father, as, as we learn about this concept of covenant, Lord God, we recognize that it's just something different than what we're used to in our culture. And, and Lord, so often we look at you through eyes of our culture. We look at you in a way that, that we look at other humans and, and we don't understand faith, Lord God because we don't understand this covenant. Father, I pray that, that you would help us to see you in each and every circumstance. And I pray, Father, that you would strengthen our faith and help us to lay hold of your promises, Lord. Lord, that no matter what we go through, no matter what situation, no matter what struggle, 
no matter what adversity, Lord God, that we would recognize that you are at work in our lives, that you will never abandon us, you will never forsake us, that you will always work for our good. And Lord, as we lay hold of those promises, Lord, we thank you that you are transforming our lives, Lord God, and that you are making us to be a new people, both by word and by deed and by character. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Covenant worldview is not a term that you'll hear very often. In fact, you might not hear it at all apart from this series. But I think it really says a lot about what we talked about tonight. You know, when I read through the scriptures, I recognize that covenant is a concept that is central to God's interaction with humanity from start to finish. You know, how do we define the two parts of the Bible by the old covenant and the new covenant? Uh, and yet, for some reason, we just don't get it. You know, covenant is a concept that in our Western culture, it just doesn't fit with our mindset. We can't process it for some reason. You know, nowhere is the scene, I think, as clearly as uh, what I talked about in chapter 9, how I began chapter 9, and talking about divorce fairs. You know, when we look at the issues of marriage and divorce, uh, it shows a horrible lack of covenant understanding uh, in relationship to this concept. Why is it that our vows mean so little these days? You know, how is it that, that you can have two individuals stand at an altar uh, and exchange ring and, rings and exchange vows and, and six months later have themselves divorced or, or even 10 years or 20 years later? You know, this, this is to be till death do us part. And, and it's a covenant concept. And because we have lost an understanding of this concept, because we've lost our comprehension, We've really paid a significant price, not just in our marriages, but, but for our children. Now, I think that part of the problem here for us is that we tend to view a covenant as some, something like a super glued commitment. You know, get out the glue and, and put it on there and, and put that thing together and, and come hell or high water, we are going to hold together no matter what happens. We may be miserable, but we're going to stay together. Well, I, I think that this totally misses an understanding of God's design for a covenant relationship. You know, the reason that God initiated covenants with the human race is because of his faithful love for us. And what's going to make a marriage work is, is love. Commitment might make it last, but covenant love is what makes it work. When you have two individuals who honor one another, who cherish one another, who care for one another, who put each other ahead of themselves in this relationship, then you have a relationship that'll work. But again, this is all reflective of God's love for us. You know, when we think about God and his faithfulness to us, it's not because he has to, it's because he wants to. And, and so we're going to spend some time in chapter 10 looking at what I call God's covenant love for us. I Actually, I call it dead dog love because it is a love of, of a God, of a heavenly father who cares so much about his children that no matter how wretched we are, he continues to love us with a faithfulness that can't ever be measured.